Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And welcome to a new live event with um, Career Foundry. Um, today, it's all about how to start your dream career in tech in seven steps. My name is Belinda. I'm Junior's event manager here at Career Foundry. And I'm very happy to welcome back again to the channel Susan Clark, who is one of our senior career specialists. Susan will introduce herself in a bit, and I would like to introduce you to Career Foundry for those who are new to the channel. Career Foundry is the online school for your career change into tech. We guide you from complete beginner to job ready professional in UX, UI design, data analytics, full stack web development, digital marketing, and product management, and help you land your first job in the field. We are not any old school. Our programs are so flexible that you, not, you don't need to quit your job to change your career. You get regular one-to-one -one mentorship from not one, but two industry experts. And if you don't land a job within 180 days of graduation, we refund your tuition. And that's our job guarantee. A few things before we start with the presentation. There is a chat on the right-hand side, so please feel free to introduce yourself. Tell us where you are watching us from and maybe why you are interested in a career in tech. The session will be recorded and we will send the recording out tomorrow via email for those who are registered in Big Marker. If you have any questions for Susan, please drop them in the chat and we will answer them at the Q&A at the end. If you have any questions about Career Foundry's programs, please I recommend to book a call with one of our program advisors. They will answer all of your questions and even provide you with further information. And right now I'll pass the floor to Susan, but I'll be back for the Q&A to address all of your questions. So please, Susan, go ahead with the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Belinda. Hi, everyone. Um, as Belinda mentioned, I'm Susan. I'm a senior career specialist here at Career Foundry. And what I really do at Career Foundry is um, I support people during their job search. So I'm helping um, as people go along through their job change. Here at Career Foundry, which I really like a lot, is that we don't just help you change your career education wise, but you are, as a student, you are assigned a career specialist. And that career specialist, it helps you navigate the process from going from student in a new field into getting a job. Um, so that's my day job. And then, uh, and then I also get the opportunity to give webinars to you all and provide really helpful information. If you want to know more about me, because this is not about me, this is about helping you get into tech. Um, you can stalk me. You're welcome to stalk me on LinkedIn. So just to kind of give you an overall agenda of what we're going to be covering today. So in this order, we're going to be kind of first looking at determining what's the best fit for you. Sometimes I find where people tell me they want to get into tech um, because it's good money or it's a solid career choice, um, but they don't know what direction to go into tech. So first, 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 most important thing is figuring out kind of what's a good fit for you. Then it's all about planning, developing an action plan, making sure that you um, step by step know what to do. Next is obtaining skills in the field. And by doing that is uh, education. So some type of education to be able for you to be trained in this new area that you want to get into. Next, practicing your skills um, because practice makes perfect. So we all will need to get in some practice work before we get into um, a company, let's say. And then it's developing a portfolio to show off that you know you're, you have these new skills and that you can do it. Um, and then networking your way into a job because this is very, very efficient um, to build up a network in within tech in order to help you to get a job later on and then applying for your dream job and sending out applications. So we're gonna go through all of this today. So I might be a bit short on some sections, just giving an overview. Um, but if you do have follow-up questions, um, like Belinda said, please feel free to drop those in the Q and A. So first things first, uh, what's the best fit for you? 
So I really love this concept of Ikigai. Um, Ikigai is a Japanese concept, which is really basically summarizing, finding your purpose. Like what is your um, purpose here that will make you feel great about what you do? So it's really like a center. Um, fun fact about Ikigai, I found this concept out when I went to my local pizzeria. It's really tiny. Um, just a place where you can pop in and grab your pizza. You can't even eat. And I saw this Ikigai Venn diagram on the wall. Um, and so I asked the guy that owns the pizzeria and also makes the pizza. He's a one man show. I said, oh, hey, what's this? And he goes, Ikigai, I love it. And I, I said, oh, tell me more. And he, so he explained, it's what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for and what you're good at. And so those main elements, the center of it is your Ikigai, it's your purpose. Um, and he said for him, he did lots of jobs and for him it was baking, making pizzas. And so his dream was to do this and bring happiness to people by making pizzas. And so I was obsessed with the idea, went down this direction. Um, and now this is what I encourage people to do. When you know you're in a job, in a field, you're not happy with at the moment, you're not really finding any um, satisfaction or pleasure in what you do, it's looking for your icky guy. So this is like a nice uh, diagram to kind of break things down, to have you think about it. And as you see, there's some intersections, like what you're good at and what you love is a passion, but it doesn't have everything or what you're good at and what you can be paid for is your profession. So sometimes some people have some overlaps now, but um, of course the sweet spot is finding your key guy. So if we start thinking about, okay, what does Ikigai look like for you? Um, so what I usually encourage people is you can jot down with a pen and paper some of these questions, or since we're here on a computer, take a screenshot of this to really ask yourself these questions later, um, because this will kind of help lead you to thinking about Ikigai, your purpose. So you can start thinking about what are your three greatest strengths? What are some of your hobbies, your interests, things you like to do? You can also think about um, if you already know, maybe, are there some careers that you thought, oh, this could be interesting. I could enjoy this or something that you think uh, are, is interesting and that you would like to learn more about it. So any kind of those careers, make a note of that. Um, what does success look like? Keep in mind, this is your definition. It's not what success looks like to, um, to anyone on the outside or what society says success looks like. What does success look like for you? Um, define it. Try to write it down. Uh, another one, I'm very big about following gut feelings, following, what, following your heart, following what your inner self is telling you. So ask, what, what is your inner gut telling you? Is there a direction that you're being pushed towards? Um, what action would you take if you valued and trusted yourself more? So I find often sometimes we can put ourselves on the back burner because we're caring for a loved one or we're like, uh, whether it be children or parents, or we're overwhelmed with daily life. And so we're just trying to keep things afloat. Um, so we don't even think about the fact that if we valued ourselves, what would we allow ourselves to move into? Um, and then trusting yourself more. Sometimes people are scared to make a career change because they're worried, am I making a big mistake? So if you trusted yourself to make this career change, what would you change it into? What do you think that maybe you would go for? Another question, uh, if you were at your best, what would you do right now? So if you were feeling 100%, feeling really great in your, in your own skin, feeling great about life, what would you decide to do? These are just some like nice questions to kind of help you get the process going of brainstorming what could maybe be a good fit for you uh, direction wise. Of course, you're not going to find your icky guide just by these initial questions, but it does help you.
You can also Google for more information about Ikigai because Ikigai, we could do a whole session on because um, it's quite interesting to find, um, find what we're going for and what we find our purpose is. So next, after you know, and so many of you, for example, on this webinar, maybe already know what you want to do. Maybe you already have a good sense of, okay, well, I already know my, um, my icky guy is working with something with uh, coding because I love building things. And I love building things that matter to people or that have a positive impact. Great. So you already know what you want to do. Um, so if you, in this case, if you feel like that, fantastic. Let's look into what you do next. So your career change. So this is first, first thing, it is a long process. Please keep this in mind that it's not easy. Otherwise everyone would do it, but is it, it is extremely rewarding. Um, if you don't like the direction that you're at now, you don't like what you're doing, you don't feel, um, you don't feel good in like, in, in every situation. And I've been there and I say that from someone who's been there because I haven't always been um, a career coach. I myself changed my career. So been there, done that, I completely understand. But it's so rewarding when you get into something that you love and you love to wake up and you love to go to your job. So just be aware that it is a lot of hard work, but if you're dedicated, you can make it happen. So the first part of this Getting, besides getting your mind right, is researching what skills in education are needed for this career. So if we continue with my example of coding, being a web developer or some type of developer, first you need to research what skills in education are needed for this career. So maybe for skills you see, maybe you say, I see someone wrote about being a front-end developer. So if you wanna be a front-end developer, look to see what kind of skills are needed. Um, you maybe do a simple Google search and find that HTML, CSS, these are important things for a front-end developer to know because they're facing, they're focusing on putting a design in place on a website. Also education-wise, is there any education um, required for this? Any kind of set education? Do you need a diploma or a degree? Or can you come self-taught? Do you have to do... Um, any kind of test to certify your knowledge before working at a company. So these are some things that you could you could research, for example. Next, after doing research about what kinds of skills and education you need, do an informational interview with someone in your dream career. I know this is a strange word. I know most people don't know what this is, but an informational interview is just simply to get information. So it's simply talking to someone in that field, uh, talking to someone in that field to learn more um, about what they do. Because sometimes we can like the idea of something, but then when we, when we find out the day to day, we say, oh, maybe I actually don't want to do that. So it's important to meet with someone who actually has this job because you can find out more of what it includes. Because maybe you only like one aspect of the job, but then there's 70% of the job you would hate. So it's important to meet with someone that can answer all of your questions just to make sure before you invest all the time and effort, it really is something you wanna do. Next, you'll have to determine how many hours per week you can dedicate to your career change. Um, we all are busy, we all have things going on in our lives. So you have to be aware of, you know, on top of everything else going on, can you dedicate uh, three hours per week five hours per week, 10 hours per week, go ahead and determine how many hours per week it is. Just know if you can only spend three hours a week, it could take you much longer to change, but that doesn't mean that you can never change. It just may take you longer than someone else. And then next, choosing some type of educational program. This is not to say that you need to go back, you need to go to university or you need to do a very extensive program. No, there's Education can be general. You can learn by reading books. You can learn by watching videos. Education is just anything where you are soaking up new information and, um, and learning in the process. So these are your first steps 
in regards to your career change. Once you set those, you're then going to think a little bit further. So after those steps, think about, okay, I may have looked at, you know, what kinds of education I need. I'm looking, I've confirmed that, okay, yes, this is for sure what I want to do. Um, know that set education deadlines. So when do you want to start a program or when do you want to start learning by and when do you expect to have knowledge within that certain sector or that certain specific tool or skill? Also know always in tech, pretty much no matter what field you go in within tech, you're going to need some type of portfolio because a portfolio is going to show um, that you know and have the skills that you say you do. So a portfolio is going to be very much necessary. Then networking with people. This is so important because quite a lot of people get jobs by who they know. Um, some people are really lucky and they're born into families that naturally network and parents that are influential and know a lot of people. So their children are naturally helped. A lot of us are not. We're, we're born into normal families. And in this case, we have to learn how to network ourselves. So really going out to different kinds of events and meeting people already within the sector and already within the industry and meeting people that, um, that are similar to you as well. So usually I say the easiest way to start networking is go ahead and network with people you know, tell them what you're interested in, and then ask them if they have any friends that are also in the same industry and start connecting with friends of friends first because that makes it less stressful. Um, next, you'll look at jobs that you're going to apply for. So different types of jobs that you're interested in, because we can easily say you're interested in front end web development, but okay, well, maybe what does that include front end web development? Um, so maybe it's, I, I've seen like it sometimes called a, um, design developer, or um, online developer or like a, a, some kind of hybrid term and not always front end. So make sure you know what types of jobs you wanna apply for, when you wanna start to apply for jobs by, and just an idea when you would like to have a job. Um, another thing is upskilling. What you learn now is not always going to be, um, is not, always going to be enough. Even me, for example, I'm currently enrolled in a coaching program because coaching is my domain and I want to learn new, um, new ways to coach people. And so I'm constantly bettering myself. Often in tech, you have to upskill really often because there's new technology coming out all the time and you have to be aware of it. So just be aware that you learning now is not the end of learning. You have to be a fan of lifelong learning because that's important when you go into the tech industry. So going back to this idea of obtaining education in the field, this is really, really important, which is why I've honed in on this because before you can change your career, you have to have enough knowledge, sufficient knowledge within this career in order to make the success happen. But like I said, you don't need to go to university and get a, a four year degree or even to go for you know six years and get a master's. No, it depends on the role, but education just means you need to teach yourself some of these skills. So if we're looking at ways to do that. So one way to do this is self-study, which I mentioned before. So this is uh, what you can do. So. With self-study, I often think of things like YouTube tutorials, um, Udemy courses. So Udemy is a platform online that often has a lot of free courses provided to the public. Um, books that are out there that you can even get, not even that you have to buy, but you can get from your local library. Um, so there's a lot of pros to this. Um, so self-study, obviously it's cost is one thing. So it can be free or minimal cost. Um, Another pro is that you can change your career direction. So maybe let's say that 
you start doing, uh, you start learning about front end development, and then you realize, oh, I actually don't really like the developing so much. I actually prefer the designing. So maybe I want to be a UI designer rather than a front end developer. With self study, it's easy because you just realize, yeah, that's not for me. Let me pick up and learn something else now. Let's move into the direction of UI. Um, so that kind of goes into with the ability to change directions. It's the flexibility that you have when you're learning on your with yourself. So you can learn what you want and when you want. There's not a strict timeline. The cons, though, is it's not structured at all. You don't have any deadlines. So there's no you're not being held accountable and you're completely on your own. There's you have no one to support you. So if you do self-study, you have to be someone that is extremely, extremely motivated and someone that is going to hold themselves accountable to every day learn something new. Um, so that's one aspect. Another one is online courses. So you can think of something like Career Foundry, or there's other boot camps out there that help you change your career. Uh, pros with this is that often these programs are created with career changers in mind. So they are often um, within a format online that allows you to complete them when you can. You can either do a part-time or a full-time program no normally, and you uh, can move through the lessons pretty much at your pace. There is a combination typically of theory and practice. So you aren't only learning the whys, but you're actually getting to do it yourself. So you do um, implement what you learn. Uh, these kind of online schools also provide often support and mentorship uh, to the people that enroll as their students. The problem is that programs like the curriculum can be set. So what you learn is what they have structured and you don't really get to explore and learn new things. You're on their program, you do their program. The financial investment sometimes can be steep. So it's not for everyone because in the sense that maybe you don't have that money available or maybe you're unable to, to get that kind of money together. And also online learning. Um, because not everyone, I think most people out there haven't done online learning because we've done formal education um, in person. And so online learning is completely different. So you have to be aware of if that's an environment you think that you, you can work within. In-person courses, uh, pros of this is you have a guidance from a teacher. It's a very dynamic learning setting. So you're not just on a screen. And it is usually set up for a certain type of population. So usually the people that are doing the courses with you in person either have some kind of similar background as you. Um, the problem is that you have to meet usually at a certain location at exact times every day, which is difficult if you have already a very rigid schedule or commitments. Um, class progression does depend on the majority. So let's say that maybe you're learning super fast, but the rest of the class is learning at a bit of a slower pace. You're going to maybe feel stunted or vice versa. The, the class is moving way too fast and you feel like you cannot keep up. So the, the progression does depend on the majority. Um, often there's limited places, so they will not be able to accept everyone. And so maybe there's a wait list of some kind. So maybe you have to, to wait to be um, involved in some of those. And the last thing is degree programs, which I think most people know about where you are getting some kind of accredited degree program, um, whether we think of an associate's or a bachelor or master's degree. Um, the pro is that these are often accredited. So you will be able to go to um, other places and your skills will be recognized. Also the detail of the study, because you're studying for so long between two to six years, sometimes longer on a subject, you're very knowledgeable about the ins and outs of that subject. And of course you also here have teacher guidance. Uh, con is that really it's very theory based. It's not practical. Like you don't really do a lot of hands on things. You maybe you mostly learn from um, from written materials or from lectures. The time commitment is a long time, as we said, between two to six years, depending on how long you want to go to school. 
and not all people are admitted. It's a very steep uh, entrance for some of uh, for some of the the universities. So this is kind of an overall look of um, how you can educate yourself, because I sometimes find people will come to me and say, I can't do university, like I don't have time, I don't have money, but know that that's not a barrier. There's other options for education, um, the ones that I've lined out previously. So just to kind of give you an idea, since I do work for Career Foundry and I do like to promote them because I do believe in what they're doing, um, is CF right for you? I don't know, but if you are interested in web development, UX, UI design, data, um, digital marketing and product management, those are our specialties at Career Foundry. And we have programs online to help career changers move into those fields. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, Career Foundry doesn't just train you on these areas that you want to get into. They also support you when looking when you're trying to get into the field, they assign you a career specialist to work with that will help you learn how to present yourself on the professional market to get a job. So um, if you're interested in any of these tech related roles, maybe you want to check out Career Foundry's website a little bit more and also talk to one of our student advisors to learn more about the, the programs available. So next, after you figured out kind of what education direction you want to go into, uh, you're going to have to practice your skills and keep practicing them. Practice while you're learning and even practice them afterwards because it's going to be new to you and practice is only going to help you get better and better. So ways that you can practice. So oftentimes in tech, you will have opportunities such as, well, one anyone can do is a personal project. So doing a project that you're interested in and utilizing those skills that you've now learned in tech um, to work towards this project. Hackathons are also a great way. If you don't know what hackathons are, usually they're most often held during a weekend and it's from Friday to Sunday and people will get together, form a team and work on a tech related project. And the idea is to come up with something feasible within a weekend timeframe. Obviously, no one's expecting perfection, but it's a way to quickly produce something. So maybe you have like a designer, a developer, um, a marketer all on the same team, and they are trying to create a fitness uh, application. So by the end of the weekend, they'll have the basis for this fitness application. So a hackathon is something that you, a way that you can kind of practice your relevant uh, tech skills. You can also volunteer. There's tons of nonprofit organizations that would love to have your experience um, because they simply just, they can't pay someone. They don't have the money. So with this, it's a great way to, um, to gain some, some experience and practice. Freelance as well. A lot of times people will tell me freelance, no one's going to hire me. I've never worked in this before. I don't know what I'm doing. Who would pay me for this? But there's a lot of very small companies and startups who don't have the budget to hire uh, an experienced person. Um, so they are willing to pay you to do a project for them, even if you are new into the field. So that is a way to, to gain practice as well. Um, as I mentioned about earlier, the portfolio is super important because this justifies that you know your stuff. Um, Usually I tell people between three to five projects is really the sweet spot because of the fact that um, if you have just one project or even two projects, it's almost like one project is a spoof. Like, okay, you did it once, but like, how do we know you really know how to do that? Two times it's okay. You have two, two projects, but I'm not sure. Can you join my company? Can you really actually help me on a project by yourself or work independently on big aspects of this project. So I find between three to five projects really shows that you didn't, you not only know the process, but you can do a project from start to finish um, and be independent by doing it. Um, as I mentioned, this is a way to show your knowledge and experience, especially as a career changer. 
if you don't have prior experience in the field that you're going into, um, a portfolio allows you to show, look, hey, I do know what I'm doing. These are three to five projects that I've done on my own. Um, this is my way of thinking. This is my solution that I that I discovered. Um, this is my work. So this is a great way to advocate for yourself when going for a new job, because when they say, oh, you don't have experience, we don't know about hiring you, you can say, oh, check out my portfolio, because your portfolio does show you know what you're doing. Going back to networking. So I mentioned a bit earlier, it's really important to network to build up your contacts within the tech industry um, related to what you're going into. So ways to network, because a lot of people have no idea um, how do you meet people? Well, there are online and in-person meetups. Um, even just like we mentioned here, meetup is an official name of a website, meetup.com. And you can look for um, events happening in your area that are focused on a topic. So let's say you're interested in data. You can type in data into Meetup to see if people are meeting um, to discuss data and have topics about um, roles or careers within data or hot topics about data and AI and the new direction of the world. Um, so with this, this is a great way to get started. Another thing is associations. So for example, when I used to live in the US and I used to work in marketing, I was a member of the American Marketing Association. And in the US, pretty much a, every major city has a local chapter of this. This was a great way for me to meet other people also working in marketing and meet with them and learn more about marketing trends, learn more about new things that they were doing within marketing, within their respected companies. Um, so that, that was one way um, to be able to network with people in the field as well as joining associations. And those can be local associations and also based by subject. Another thing that you can do as well is informational interviews. And this I talked about at the beginning when you first are trying to figure out what career to go into, right? You're trying to figure out, is this the right path for me? I think I'm interested in front-end development, but I'm not sure. You go and talk to someone in front-end development. So this is the same case. So informational interviews, you're learning more about the field. You're learning more about that person's trajectory and their career path into the field. Um, and this is a way to actually grow your network and meet people. So one way to do that is a mentor, like there's different mentorship sites. I'm a huge fan of ADP list. So it's adplist.org. Maybe I'll just type in the chat. So you guys have it. Adplist.org. Love it. I should be their spokesperson. Um, they should pay me because I talk about it so much, but it is a free website, which is why they probably cannot pay me. Um, it's a free website where people register, um, professionals register as mentors simply because they want to help the next generation coming into their field. So you can sign up for free uh, for a mentor on this website. So this is a great way to get access to people within a certain field if you're interested um, in, I don't know, product management, for example, and you want to learn more about that, you can go look on ADP list for someone that works in product management to talk more with them about it. You also can look on LinkedIn to search for people that are working within these roles that you're interested in within certain companies that you like. Um, this is primarily focused on tech, yes. A a but tech is not, uh, let's be a little bit more Sometimes people get confused because when I, when you say tech, they think, okay, it's just for like coders or something, but tech is really, really broad. So things within marketing is, is often under tech. Things within data is often under tech. Things within uh, product management is often within tech too. So um, ADP list has a lot of people that are in tech adjacent roles or things you might not necessarily think of as traditional tech. So check on the um, check on their website because they have sections of what it covers. So after you start networking and building your network, 
Um, by the way, building your network is really good just to get information, not only about the field that you're going into and what kind of possible career paths you get into. Think about networking as um, you're making professional friends uh, so that when you need help getting a job, these people will be there for you. But that should not be your first question to people when they when you network is asking them for a job. Because if some stranger came up to you on the street and said, hey, can you get me a job? Your first reaction is, who are you? Like, I don't know you. So don't ask someone randomly for a job. Get to know them. Make a friend first. Um, and then later you can ask them for support when finding a job. Going into applying for jobs. So applying for jobs, traditionally, I think uh, people, most people have gone through this process where you do an online application and you wait to hear back. Um, with this, usually with online applications, you will need several things. Uh, even if you're not applying online, there are main things that you need to have. And with this is a portfolio site, as I mentioned, because if you're going to into something tech related, you need to prove that you have the skills that you say you do, especially if you're a career changer, as I said. So you'll need a portfolio website to show um, to show projects off. And as I mentioned, between three to five projects is really key. Then you need a LinkedIn profile. So sometimes people tell me, I don't even use social media. I don't even have Facebook. I don't have uh, Instagram, whatever it may be. So I'm not going to get a LinkedIn. Let me tell you. It's super important to get a LinkedIn because of the fact that it's a norm in our society nowadays to have a LinkedIn. Yes, it's social media, if you will, but it is your online professional profile. Um, and it's really important. Sorry, guys, I didn't realize my computer was dying. So I'm just plugging it in. So this is really important to have a LinkedIn profile because it shows that you are a professional. Um, if you don't have a LinkedIn, sometimes people make the assumption, oh, they're not really professional if they don't have a LinkedIn. My aunt, my own flesh and blood, um, is high up in a company. She refuses to interview anyone who doesn't have a LinkedIn profile. I'm obviously for people, the common folk, because I'm a, I'm a career coach and I help people all day, every day look for jobs and get, get into different roles. And we've argued and I said, just because they don't have a LinkedIn doesn't mean that they're not a viable candidate. And she said, it's weird. Who does not have a professional um, profile online? They must not be that professional. I don't wanna hire someone that's not a professional. They should have some level of this. So this could be even hindering you. Not having a profile can even be hindering you from getting interviews. So it's extremely important to have a profile. Um, resume, or as we say in Europe, CV, um, this is really important as well, just to give hiring managers and recruiters an overall look of your knowledge, your skills, what you can do, and what you've succeeded and accomplished in the past. Also cover letters. Uh, this is probably one of the favorite questions that's asked to me when I'm working with people is, do I have to write a cover letter? Yes. It sucks. I know I hate cover letters too, and I know how to do them, um, but you still have to do them. Uh, even if the application doesn't require you to have one to submit your application online, I highly, highly, highly recommend it because of the fact that this is your way to convince a recruiter to invite you for an interview. Your resume CV is only going to highlight your successes and is only going to highlight key information. In a cover letter, you can tell your professional story to convince a recruiter to invite you for that interview. So these are the main things you need to have um, moving forward when applying for jobs. Just some key things to a breakdown when it comes to resumes, um, the do's and don'ts, as I like to say. So do focus on information that's that best relates to the job that you want. So for example, let's say I no longer work, want to work for Career Foundry anymore. I'm bored. Um, so I want to look for a new job. I 
I'm not, my CV should not be focused on all of my past marketing experiences because I'm not a marketer anymore. I am a career coach. So if I put, yes, I worked at Career Foundry as a career coach, but I focus too much emphasis on all my marketing skills and knowledge and experience, the recruiter is going to be thinking, what? I don't want a marketer. Why, why am I looking at a marketer's uh, resume? So make sure, even if you're a career changer, don't focus on your past. Focus on what you've been doing towards the present. So focus on the information that best relates to the job that you want. Um, make sure the top fold of your CV has the most important information. So I think I have a piece of paper here to show you. So if you have a piece of paper like this, if we fold it in half, all the most important information should be here at the top. So focus on what is at the top first, most important, because here is kind of a gray area that sometimes recruiters get to, but not always. Um, keep your layout simple and easy to read. I usually have to say this for designers because you love to get crazy and you love to show different fonts and different styling and different colors. Please, though, do not make it look like a unicorn has vomited on a piece of paper because too many colors distract from the main thing, which is it's a document to show your skills and knowledge. Um, some designers will try to tell me, but I'm showing off my design skills. Keep in mind, it's not a fellow designer that's going to be looking at your CV first. It is a recruiter and recruiters want a piece of paper that's clear and straightforward to the point um, that clearly shows them what you can do and how, how much you have in common with the job that they're trying to fill. Don't forget to tailor your resume by incorporating words from the job advert. So what this means is that recruiters are people who are recruiting period for either one company or even multiple companies. Their job is to hire people, period. They're not necessarily only focused on hiring designers or only focused on hiring developers. They're hiring people. So maybe one minute for the company, they're hiring a designer. Then the next minute, maybe they're hiring an accountant. So they don't know the ins and outs of every job. So they really rely heavily on the job advert that's posted to tell them what type of people to look for. So we often try to be creative and write things in our own words when we're writing our resume. But by doing this, you can confuse the recruiter because they don't actually see how related you are to the job advert. So make sure you're using the exact same keywords from the job advert into your resume so that it's easy for a recruiter to see, oh, uh, content marketing. They say here they do content marketing. So same exact wording. Don't. So these are some of the things please don't do. I see them, but it's not helping you. More is not better. I used to think, think the same thing. So skills list, I would have all my skills, all my skills under the sun because I thought, They'll see, I'm great. I have all these skills. No, if you have a whole bunch of skills that aren't relevant to your new career, a recruiter gets confused. Why am I going to hire her when she has all of these skills with, uh, with uh, education? I I'm hiring a, a web developer. Why do I care that you know she can uh, do curriculum? So remove any of those skills that are not related to the job you want. Don't confuse a recruiter by starting with info about your old career. So if, for example, it's common to put employment history uh, at the top. So what your current or previous role was and the description. But the bad thing is when you do that, maybe you're leading and it says that you're a server at um, Olive Garden. If you're listing your server at Olive Garden with your details, a recruiter will say, I'm trying to hire a designer. Why am I looking at a resume for a server at a restaurant? So if that's so they're going to be confused and maybe not continue reading your resume. So it's important to start with relevant information. So ways to start with relevant information is either put your education section that will show the, any kind of educational program that you did. 
starting with a skills section to show those specific skills that you have in design, for example, if you're switching into design, or having a project section on your CV at the top to show your experience already within that topic. So if you've already done like a, a design project, you have that added instead to the top of your CV to show your relevancy. So make sure you're tweaking for this purpose. Stay away from small fonts, graphics, and busy designs, because as we said, um, recruiters are not trying to check out your designs. You also need to make it easy for them. Don't make too small font because they're not going to squint to try to read it. So if they find it's going to be too hard to read your resume, they're going to toss it to the side and pick up one that is going to be easy for them. Don't send the same resume every time. People think one and done. Like I do my resume and I'm done with it. No, because like we said, it's important to incorporate the job, the keywords from the job advert into your resume. If you don't, recruiters won't understand. So for this, I could say the exact same thing basically as the job advert, just in my own words. But since a recruiter doesn't know the ins and outs of that job, they won't realize I'm a good fit. So it's really important that you can have a like a common base for your resume, but you need to be tweaking it for every single job you apply for. Otherwise, if you're not getting responses from recruiters, that's why, because they don't see how the, the commonality between you and the job advert. Um, moving on to cover letters, again, do's and don'ts here. So do explain clearly why you want to work for the company where you're applying. Um, as a part of my job, helping people find jobs, I often read people's cover letters to help them and provide some suggestions and advice. And oh my God, the, I read so many cover letters that say, I'm applying for Zalando because I think it's a great company. I want to work for you guys. And this is boring. Anyone can say this. And it sounds very insincere also. So make sure you explain a clear reason why. So if you if you like Zalando, explain like, I've been buying my shoes from Zalando for the past five years. I love how easy that the company has made it to be able to buy shoes and have it delivered straight to my door. I've been a fan and telling everyone about it since, since the beginning, because then they see, oh, she wants to work for us because she actually really loves our company. But you don't just say, I love it. You're explaining why you love it. Um, make sure that you talk about how you previous, how you use skills that they ask for in the job advert. So if the job advert is asking for excellent communication skills, explain how in the past that you used uh, communication skills. So uh, explain that uh, as a server at the Olive Garden restaurant, you regularly had to communicate with people um, effectively to understand their needs, their wants and needs uh, for their dining experience. So that can be an example of a communication skill. Um, again, write a cover letter for each application highlighting your fit for that specific role. Please don't reuse cover letters because again, like the resume, if you're not tailoring it for the job advert, a recruiter won't see that you're a good fit because they won't see the commonalities. So you really have to tailor it for every single job. Don't simply write that the good that the job seems interesting or good. So what I talked about just with the dues, um, that uh, that it's boring and you sound insincere. So give them a good reason. Don't give a list of your skills. I often find people say, "I'm most qualified." For this role because and then they give a bullet point list of all the skills that they have they already have your resume they already have the cv that lists your skills they don't need you to say the exact same thing in the cover letter again boring and you're wasting their time saying the same thing use the cover letter to explain how you have those skills how have you put those into practice justify having those skills um and yeah don't use the same one over and over because the recruiter won't see your relevance if you're using it over and over again. Trust me, I tried. This is why I failed. This is why I've cried many times when I, in the past when I've done my own job searches because I was just sending out routine 
um, resume and cover letters that weren't tailored to the specific job. So takeaway from that, each application should be unique. Have a base for them, but then tweak them. Please make sure you're tweaking them. So with that, I will invite Belinda back so I can take a minute to breathe um, because I try to talk fast to give you all the information and then Belinda can ask uh, some questions that may already be here for us. Thank you so much, Susan. It's been a super, super interesting uh, presentation, um, very insightful, very informative, and you can see that the people on the chat also have found it uh, very uh, useful and with great and useful information. So thank you so much, Susan. We have so, so many questions, so we are gonna try to address most of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone for posting all of them. I'm really happy that you mentioned in your uh, presentation, as we spoke before, Susan and I, we were speaking about the concept Ikigai before, which is super interesting. And I highly recommend there are so many books out there uh, where you can um, know about this concept. Um, I didn't know about it and I read just one book and I found it amazing and really, really good for your career. So I have just one question from my side because I'm just curious, Susan. Um, mm -hmm. How long, how long could it take like to find your ikigai? And do you think it could change eventually, or there is just one ikigai for one person? No, no, no. There's not one ikigai for one person. I think that's kind of a myth that also is problematic: is that we think that we have to find our passion, find our direction. But there's not one direction. I always tell people. I've changed my career several times now and my career was right for me at that moment. And I always say that now because I love, I love what I do. I love career coaching. I love helping and supporting people and it's good for me right now, but who knows in five years, maybe I will want to try something else um, because we grow as people, right? And we have new interests at, all, all the time. So don't feel stuck like I have to pick the right perfect thing now forever. No, it, life is great. We have the opportunity to um, to try new things. And so don't be afraid. My main thing is I find usually it takes longer for people who are afraid of making a mistake. There is no mistake. There's only the experience. And what you learn, I've seen tons of people who learn coding and decided, no, that's not for them but their background in information and coding actually helped them get their next job because just having a foundation in coding helped them be able to talk more about tech projects. And they've gone into something like project management or they've gone into design. So there's even something you may be learning now and you think, oh, I realize now that's wrong for me or I don't really wanna do that. That's okay, transferable skills thing you have. Good, then we could find many Ikigai Salon our career path. Yes. That's good. That's good. Okay. Um, I would like to make a question from a comment from someone who posted that um, career change means go back to zero. And this person really would like to do a career change. So I would like to add a question to that comment, which okay. is, do we really start from zero or do we bring transferable skills from mm -hmm. our previous background? Yes. So, uh, so it, interesting enough, like I often find quite a bit of people that I coach from Career Foundry do not go back to zero. They are going even into mid-level roles um, because, in, because of the fact that they have so many transferable skills. So I saw someone mention something about having experience as an industrial designer. I don't know what you're interested in switching into, but I think I've already coached at least 10 people switching from industrial design to either UX or UI design. It's a very natural transition because of the fact design, when design is design, I feel like it, you have a lot of basic concepts um, that overlap. And so as long as you justify that in your professional materials, you have to connect the dots again for recruiters when you're doing a career change, because if they see industrial design and then UX design, they say, oh no, but I'm hiring a UX designer. So it's your job then to explain actually industrial design is designing a product, but a product like a physical product, whereas UX design is just designing a 
product, uh, a digital product. So it's explaining you have the same exact concepts in the same, uh, the same kind of pathway. It's just in a different space. So you're just taking the skills you already use in industrial design and applying it to, uh, to online. Obviously, there's differences, but you're still taking a lot of what you previously did. So um, I've helped coach a lot of industrial designers, for example, do a successful change. Uh, there's people even who come from um, come from completely different backgrounds and that are scared and worried. Look, I, I hate this phrase. I was just a waitress in a wet restaurant. Like, who is going to hire me to do coding? Um, you have a lot of key skills communication being one of them. Communication is super important when you are um, working and on developing a website or working on an app, working with people, knowing how to communicate effectively with people, knowing how to, um, knowing uh, how to get things done in an in order and follow directions. These are all transferable skills. But again, you have to explain this in your professional materials or the recruiter will not understand. It's all about connecting the dots. And I think many people don't realize how many transferable skills there are from so many different jobs. I've seen so many people from various backgrounds come into seemingly completely different roles. Great, great insight. Thank you, Susan. Okay, we have um, people uh, who is asking about shifting and how to market ourselves. So I would like to get the example that Ivoni um, um, shared with us. Mm -hmm. So Ivoni, I'm sorry if I pronounce anyone's name wrongly, it's not intentionally. So the question is, yeah. Can, yeah, can you discuss shifting? I'm a senior industrial designer with 10 years of experience. It would be less ideal to start from the beginning. So if you could please discuss selling the skills that overlap uh, and more. Yeah. And I, I discussed a little bit a minute ago, but for example, you would not, honestly, I would not, if you were working with me and I was your career coach, I would not allow you to apply for junior roles, for example. Like, no, you already have 10 years in industrial design. Why would you start over? That's madness. So you should not be going at all under mid-level roles and upper mid-level. And even then, I've seen people go from industrial design into senior UX design roles So because there's so many skills overlap. But it's explaining that. It's explaining all the skills that you have from design that overlap. So you can talk about color. You can talk about... Um, uh, you can talk about... Um, usability because this is something you think about when you design physical products you're thinking about how how is this going to be used use cases um what could be the possible issues that someone faces with this kind of prod product uh you can look at the fact of that you've worked with clients before um or that you've done uh, user testing because you do both user testing with industrial design and in UX design. So there's a lot of things you would do. And I don't know if UX design is some, is what you're interested in. I've made an assumption here from reading your, your thing, but there's a lot of key overlap things you can talk about. And sometimes people worry if they don't have something like moving from one type of design to the other type. Like I said, even something like being a server in a restaurant or being a barista or um, being in, uh, I see a lot more people moving from education, like teachers moving into tech now because they're sick of teaching. All of these have very, very valuable transferable skills um, to, to talk about. Um, so most of the time, as it's just about marketing yourself so you don't have to start over. Um, it, sure, if you don't market yourself well, you may do have to start over from scratch. But as long as you explain your skills you effectively, you will definitely not be starting from zero. Um, really, most people that I work with um, start at a higher level junior roles, almost to mid-level, um, because most people that come to Career Foundry are not really young, they are career changers. Um, I would say, 
I have to look it up. I actually don't know our average age of our student, but it's not typical that I get, you know, I don't know, 18, 20 or 22 year olds. It's mostly millennials that I get and, and Gen Xers and even some, um, even some people into their sixties that decide, oh, I just want to try something new. Um, so you already were doing a job before. So you do have transferable skills to discuss. Good. Thank you, Susan. I think we can find all of those. I, I found interest you were sharing about the age. And, and so I think you can find that information in our website, I reckon. I'm not too sure, but you can do a research and you can find some of this information that Susan is speaking about in our um, website. It's going to be super interesting. Okay. Um, I would like to... Mm -hmm. address the a question from Barita because she would like to know how to be able to get front end development job and she has taken three uh, codes courses but mm -hmm. she doesn't know uh, where to go from there um, and she really would like uh, to do this career change because she loves and joins uh, coding sorry mm -hmm. so she would like to receive some advice yeah absolutely uh, so that's the problem. A lot of times people think, okay, I do the education. Now what? Um, I should have a job or why can't I get a job because I'm applying? Oftentimes it's because of the fact that um, maybe your resume is still too aligned to being a dietitian versus being a coder. And, and a lot of people tend to have an imposter syndrome. No, I'm a dietitian that codes. Uh, so your resume reflects that, but no, 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 you're not a dietitian that codes. You are a developer who has a background in, um, in dietary, uh, management or however you want to call it. Um, focus on the fact you don't need anyone to justify that you are a developer. No, you're a developer. You took these courses, you learned how to develop, you are a developer, call yourself that, own it. Um, with this, make sure you network. Um, so one thing, look over your resume, see, make sure that it's tailored highly enough to development and not um, uh, your experience as a dietitian. And then network like crazy, meet people, find out how they got into coding, find out um, their career path, uh, ask them to give you advice on how to get into the, uh, into the market, practice your skills so that you are keeping, uh, you're keeping your skills up. You can also meet people by doing coding challenges and participating in hackathons. My partner, um, at the base used to be a coder. He's now in management and tech, but starting out, he was a coder and he would participate in hackathons, even though he had a job because it's fun. He got to meet other coders and he got to build like cool, build cool projects. So this is a great way to actually meet people that are employed um, and learn more. And they, that's a great way to also show off your skills within coding. Um, so I would say those things first and foremost, if you do find that you're still struggling, maybe it is worth looking to get yourself a career coach to kind of help. Um, because I do find doing a career change is really, really hard to do on your own. Um, if you're like me, you might need handholding. I've hired a career coach for myself before because I needed someone to help me along. So um, those are just some options for you. Good. Thank you, Susan. Super useful tips. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, could you share with us what, what type of support students receive from career specialists in career foundry programs? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, and just to give like a little disclaimer. So I am also on the side, a private career coach. I do it outside of career foundry also, but I work with career foundry, honestly, because I really support the message and I love what they do. And I love that they, they go beyond just teaching. They realize that you need support also when it comes to looking for jobs. 
So what we do is we have a dedicated program after you finish your main course uh, where you're learning the main things for your new field. We'll have the job preparation course where we teach you completely how to do your resume, how to write cover letters, how to properly do networking because most people, I would say really most people don't know how to network. I, for the longest time, didn't know how to network efficiently. So I was thinking I was networking, but it wasn't working. So we do really in, in detail talk about what networking is, how you can network successfully. Um, we discuss as well, we help you develop a strategy on how to tackle your career change, how to tackle the job search, how to find a job. We work on your portfolio together, how to structure your portfolio to make sure that you are um, convincing hiring managers of your skills and of your knowledge. We also are there. It's kind of funny. We're, we're also there emotion, for emotional support because, I mean, it's hard. The job search is hard. Changing your career is hard. So sometimes, like, when you get a lot of rejections, it hurts. Again, I changed my career, so I know. Uh I'm very sensitive and will cry my eyes out when I get a rejection. Um, so sometimes it's good just for that you do have someone there for you. And so we are here for you as well, because we know, we know it's hard. Um, and you're not alone during the process. So we're constantly helping and advising and saying, okay, try this, do this. Let's see what comes from this. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Susan, for, for sharing this. And thank you for the great job you do for, for the students. It's amazing what you do. So thank you. Um, OK, I'm mindful of the time. Um, so we are going to take a couple of more questions. I see, as you were speaking about the LinkedIn profile, which I found very, very uh, interesting. So Linulua is asking, in the event of career change, how do you build a LinkedIn profile without any tech work experience? Is it okay for your profile to have a non-tech work experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, because I mean, that's what it is. As a career changer, you're going to have stuff that that's not related. Um, and so it's okay, but then you need to focus to do that shift. So um, you need to be able to, um, to write all of the relevant things that, um, that show what you do. Hold on, let's see. Um, if I can do this. Um, screen. Okay. Good. Belinda, can you see my screen? Yeah, I see it. Good, good. Good, good, good. So just as a quick show. So this is my LinkedIn. Let's say I don't want to be a career coach anymore. Uh, the first thing I would do is change here uh, my headline so people know. Because obviously when you scroll down, the first thing you see is that I say I'm a career specialist, career specialist, career coach. So you're going to see that in the experience section. But I can go ahead and change it and tell you now... I don't know. Uh, I want to be a journalist. So then I would say something like um, a journalist focused on um, writing about current events or something like this, something journalism related. Then another thing you can do is add a featured section where you would then add any relevant work that you have related to that new job change. So if I want to be a journalist, I would show my writing and maybe show a place where I've been published or maybe my own blog. So having a featured section is uh, really key, again, to show relevancy to the new role you're going to. Then when you scroll down in your about section, that's another section they'll see before they even get to experience, you would say, uh, in my case, I would call myself a journalist because that's what I'm changing to. So I'm a journalist with a background in career coaching. And then I would go on to explain about all my skills within journalism so that when by the time they get to the experience, I've already I've already tr trained them to see me as a journalist. So then when they see my job as a career coach, they're not like, wait a minute, what? So make sure all your marketing of yourself before they get to the experience is talking about your new 
direction, your new field. Please do not call yourself an aspiring, aspiring whatever. No, own it. If you are changing into design, development, whatever, say that you're a developer, say that you're a designer. Please don't call yourself an as aspiring designer because no one wants to hire an aspiring designer. No, they want to hire a designer. So marketing yourself is really key. And even then you can add additional support things um, education you did in a, the relevant field you're moving into, adding any projects to show, again, this relevant knowledge that you have, um, and the skills section as well, adding skills that show um, this field that you want to go into. So even though you're changing careers, it doesn't, um, it doesn't matter because you will show it's not just the experience section. Okay, super useful. Thank you so much, Susan. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so to close uh, the Q&A for this time, we try to um, address most of your questions, and I'm sorry if we don't, if, if we leave some of them, I think we try our best today. Um, so I would like to close the Q&A with a question related to artificial intelligence, which is now very trendy. Yeah. And the question is from Agota, and is artificial intelligence in UX design. Will there be new skills to learn? And what are them, if you know more or less? So yes, there's always new skills to learn when when new technology when technology simply evolves, right? Um, there's always going to be something new to learn. With artificial intelligence, I know some people were even asking me, are design jobs going to even exist? Of course, because yes, um, Artificial intelligence can maybe help us with design, but it's not going to completely replace our jobs. We'll just be utilizing artificial intelligence to be better designers out there. So um, it's more so about staying up to date with latest trends when it comes to any kind of artificial intelligence or any kind of latest tools coming out and learning how to implement those regularly into your work practice so that you are up to date on the latest trends so that when tools come out that are highly tailored for design, it's going to be an easy um, switch for you to utilize those into your design practice. Is this still a thing that it's going on and it still is not defined, this thing of artificial intelligence and what uh, skills we need to learn? Or I would say... Yeah. yeah, because if you think about it, artificial intelligence is just a key word for a huge sector of things. So artificial intelligence can include a lot of different tools and a lot of different um, topics. So you can think of artificial intelligence as being people that are putting together robots that that talk and that are becoming more smart so that they function very much like a human would and be able to respond like a human would when you ask questions. Um, at the same time, artificial intelligence can be something like chat GPT. So it can come in so many different formats. It's a bit vague if we just say the word artificial intelligence, but we will start to see more and more technology evolve. That is, if you want to say, for lack of better words, and to simplify it, smart technology, technology that is going to be more intelligent and it's able to do things and mimic humans and be able to do things more closer to human capacity and think like a human to some extent, be able to think logically. But the thing about humans is we have also an emotional side of things. So AI will not 100% replace us. I know this is often a concern for people. Is AI going to take my job? No, because at the end of the day, we are humans and we'll be able to still do things that machines cannot because machines don't have feelings. Humans have feelings. And yes, a lot of decisions are based on logic, but we often do need human feelings um, because we're working with people. Good, great. Thank you so much, Susan. I really, really enjoy hearing all of your answers and the presentation. So thank you so much. Yes, of course. It's a pleasure to have you back. Um, okay, so before we close the webinar, I would like to share with you a few interesting things. Um, so if there, if there is one here interested in a career change, 
Career Foundry is offering a tuition reduction worth up to $1,470 and €1,370 of the full price of our UX and UI design, full stack web development, digital marketing, and product management programs. And there is also a monthly offer for the data analytics. And if you would like to receive more information about, I recommend booking a call with one of our program advisors to receive the best information and to answer all of your questions. And you can do that by simply clicking on the sticky note that you can see at the top of the chat. Regarding useful resources, we have shared many already in the chat, but also Career Foundry has a fantastic blog where you can read great articles and also a YouTube channel where you can watch really good video content all about UX and UI design, data analytics, digital marketing, and much more. And also, if you enjoyed this webinar, I highly recommend checking out our events page because we have a lot of more upcoming events about career change stories, skill workshops to learn how to use Figma and to learn Tableau and, and much more. And you can find all in, the information in our events website. And last but not least, as Susan already mentioned, uh, to know, to figure out what is the right path for you in your career is one of the key steps. So Career Foundry offers a free short course in every of its program to help you to figure out that. Um, it's super simple, very easy to use. You just register with your email and I'll share the link here in the chat so you can have a look and yeah, just try out what could be the right path for you. And yeah, I would like to ask Susan if, if you want to share anything before we close the webinar. Yeah, I just wish everyone best of luck if you are thinking about a career change, as I mentioned in the beginning. I mean, it is a time investment. It is work. Um, it's not always easy, but it's very rewarding to finally switch into something that you, you love what you do and you wake up and you enjoy. Yeah, you en you're enjoying what you do during the day and not just waiting for the weekend. So, um, yes, wish you best of luck on your, your journey. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you for being with us today and for a great presentation. Also, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. And I hope you have really enjoyed the session so much and learned so much. And last but not least, thank you to the whole team behind uh, the scene who support the events and make it possible. Have a great day, everyone. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you soon. Uh, goodbye and have a great day, Susan. Take care. Take care, everyone.